Hello, this is Tom Scher with an Extension Agricultural Engineer at North Dakota State University in Fargo, North Dakota. Today we're going to be talking about water control structures and pumped outlets. As you may know, Fargo is located in the middle of the Red River Valley. Over the last 15 years, the amount of tile drainage that has been installed has been increased tremendously. But uh, along with that, uh, in order to get the water out of the fields, we have to put in pumped outlets. But many farmers have invested in, in both pumped outlets and water control structures. This is an important uh, topic for us and people in the Red River Valley uh, have been through drought, they've been through uh, floods, and water control is extremely important. Throughout the rest of this uh, series of uh, modules, you'll see references to or examples of drainage water management structures. The drainage structures in this module outline will call, cover the basic design, some of the installation requirements and configurations, and then we'll follow that up with a section on drainage lift stations, why they are needed, basic design, and their management. Right here we have a picture of a basic design. You can see up here the uh, there's a barrel that extends down to the drain outlet. This can be located within a main, sub-main, or a lateral. Uh, these structures are usually plastic or polyethylene or some other type of plastic material. It has a solid base on the bottom and a cover on top. The way to control the water is with movable baffles that are inserted within the structure and you have a number of baffles and they can come in five, six, seven inch uh, height. Again, they're made out of plastic and therefore the water level can be controlled uh, plus the flow rate through there. If you'll notice on this, the baffle at the top, the water flow over the top, it acts like a weir and the height of the water above it, which would be related to the inflow from the tile, would then control how much flows over the top if it has enough head behind it. Commercial water level control structures that I know about, uh, there are two main manufacturers. This one is made by a company called uh, Advanced Drainage Systems, or ADS. You can see on the left, at the bottom of the picture, there is a, a baffle there that's six inches high and about 12 inches wide. Right next to it is the implement you would use to put it in and out of the structure. The middle picture shows where a stack of baffles in here where the tile are connected before and after the structure. It extends above ground level. And on the picture on the right, you can see where the baffles are inserted into a column to hold them. And they usually have some kind of a gasket material to keep them. Uh, sealed against the side so that they are watertight. The other commercial manufacturer of com control structures uh, for water level management in agriculture is AgriDrain. They've been around a long time. This is a picture I took off from their website which shows their basic uh, types of control structures. They are made out of UV resistant plastic PVC, gray tops. Um, they uh, have uh, inlets that can are sealable rubber gasketed that the pipe fits into. Uh, they even make an automated uh, level control structure which can be programmed to raise and lower or let uh, the water level within the control structure at specific times and even in relationship to the amount of water that's entering the control structure. Here is a close-up of the ADS uh, control structure. Uh, they're the only ones that I've got a, a model from. As you can see, the inlet and outlet are gasketed and tightened with bands to make sure that they seal watertight and soil tight to the uh, pipe connecting to it. In this picture, you can see one of the uh, baffles that would be inserted within the slot inside. You can see the rubber bands on each rubber uh, pieces on each side that uh, are gaskets that allow it to be uh, sealed up against the inside of the channel. Within the structure, you can see what this one is raised so that the flow through this 
is not controlled at all by the baffle. So whatever comes in goes out and the control structure uh, does not impinge or interfere with water flow through the structure at, in this setting, which is typically used as one of the management aspects of uh, drainage water management structures. The outlet uh, uh, controls the size of the pipe on the outlet then controls the flow through the structure whereas in this picture the baff one of the baffles is down and the other one could be inserted and therefore the flow through the structure would be controlled by the height of the baffles and the water level behind the top baffle. A complete system, you can see the cap on top, it's metal, it's got air vents to allow air to move in and out, and it's lockable. Plus you get a, you can see the removal and extraction device that comes with these control structures. These are usually stored within the structure on the downstream side uh, and so that they are accessible to move them, move the baffles up and down. This is a picture showing an installation. It's a little bit fuzzy, but I can think you can see the size of the structure can vary. That can be anywhere from a uh, six inch uh, diameter pipe inlet all the way up to uh, large sizes. These structures can have more than one outlet. In this case, notice that the pipes going in are PVC, a smooth. Uh, and uh, it is, and they have a anti-piping collar uh, on the upstream side. The pipe street, uh, piping or water movement around these structures can be a problem because they are holding water back. Uh, there's one option is to use anti-seep collars uh, in the front as being installed uh, right next to this gentleman. Another option is use 20 feet of non-perforated pipe, which can be PVC or uh, dual wall and uh, up, upstream from the structure. Uh, generally, you would want uh, anti-piping ideally on the upstream side and on the downstream side to prevent any water movement around this and washing out the structure. Of course, your the NRCS state conservation engineer will specify what is an acceptable construction within your state. So to review, Structure inlet and outlet connections must be watertight and preferably pressure rated. There is some water pressure, at least on the upstream side of these, and that can be uh, a cup, up to a couple of pounds of pressure. So they should be watertight, pressure tight, and to keep out soil. The inlet pipe to the structure should be non-perforated, neither PVC or dual wall drain tile. Anti-seep collars located 10 to 25 feet from the structure on the inlet and outlet pipes. Again, these are recommendations. Uh, many states may allow either of these or require both. Uh, soil must be solid under the structure and tamped around the structure. This is very important that it be tamped very tightly so that uh, it, again, prevent the seepage from around it, but also to hold the structure in place and hold it solidly. Here you see a picture uh, with three control structures that were installed by a farmer on a 130 acre field. Two manage water from about 40 acres each and the other controls about 50 acres. As you notice, uh, they have uh, extensions on them. Originally when they were put in, they were a little too low. This is the low part of the field. And you'll notice the sticks above the structures were built and installed by the farmer. They are attached to floats within the structure and he wanted the ability to see the water level in each from his pickup on the road rather than uh, having to get out and measure them manually every time he wanted to check the water level. I know the NRCS does not uh, uh, has specs for construction of water level control structures but I thought you might be interested in some that some farmers have built. Here we have a drawing of it, it's a side view. You'll notice that the main comes in, it's got an anti-seep collar. There's a uh, riser pipe, can be either PVC or dual wall. At the base is concrete uh, with a PVC elbow in it and a discharge. The way this works is uh, the farmer cuts a piece of PVC pipe that uh, then uh, he lowers down in when he wants water level control and the water has to rise up around the outside to go down. Uh, 
these types of structures uh, work best uh, with pipe diameters of 8 inch or less. Uh, otherwise, the uh, pieces of PVC that they install uh, get too heavy. A variation of this is uh, where the elbow, the main flows into the elbow and again operates the same way a farmer ins inserts the PVC pipe that's cut to length for the object they want and then water has to flow up and out. We cannot use these types of systems in the northern U.S. because the water would be held in the main and uh, freeze in the winter time. It would not drain properly. Uh, the first type that I showed is preferable for the northern climb. But if you look at this in the southern climbs, uh, this type of system would automatically provide a certain amount of water level control, depending on the, di at the size of the elbow that was installed. Here you can get a, see a picture of the three uh, water level control structures farmer constructed uh, put in on a field uh, in the wintertime next to the drainage ditch. And if you look down into one of them, you would see the, you can see the white PVC elbow uh, circular in the bottom. And off to the right there is uh, where the tile inlet comes. This is looking down the barrel of that water control structure. This one is a commercially available uh, water level control structure manufactured uh, by a commercial entity that specializes in sub-irrigation. Notice on the right they have a PVC insert uh, with uh, rubber boots for attaching the pipe. And if you look down the top you'll see that that PVC pipe extends to the top. The white PV, uh, that is the uh, aqua colored PVC, that is where the water would come in. Or in under sub-irrigation the white pipe would open the valve and you would put water back in. These types of, of course, this is a demo uh, system. Uh, these type of pipe uh, systems would can be used on just about any size of uh, uh, tile drains um, from laterals to submains to mains. Uh, this just points out that uh, regular control structures, the similar system could be set up for the other types of control structures that were shown to use them in sub-irrigation. The water would just be introduced on the upstream side. Another form of water control structure is the water gate manufactured by AgriDrain. It is essentially a float operated check valve. As shown in their picture, it is buried so it is out of the way of the field operation, but still controls the water level upstream from it. This is a relatively new device and there is not much field research or observation data with which to evaluate the performance of these devices in actual operation. There are some questions about the head loss through of water through these devices in free flow conditions. Plus it may be difficult to use them in retrofit operations. They will work best in a new subsurface drainage system that is designed specifically for drainage water management. Each state uh, conservation engineer will have to determine the design conditions where these this device is acceptable. But basically, if you look in the picture in the upper right hand corner, you will see that uh, you can see the floats are the white and then the uh, checked or the valve is, the, is to the right of it. In the lower picture on the right, I am holding up the uh, floats and you can see it's closed off and it closes off the water. Looking at the pictures from their website, you'll see that these are meant to be buried and installed below the surface so they are out of the way of field operations, but you still need a, a standard water level control structure at the very end of them to control the water level in each of these, and they stair-step the water back. They work best on systems that have uh, the laterals are buried uh, on the contour so that they can control the water upstream from them. The next area that I'm going to talk about are pumped outlets. I know the uh, NRCS does not cost share pumped outlets, but they are very essential to, in very flat areas. And we have many, many of them have been installed in the Red River Valley, uh, you know, North Dakota and Northwestern Minnesota. They are essential for making tile drainage systems work here. And in fact, we've been the driver of technological changes. Over the last 10 years, 
the basic design, installation, and technology associated with these have changed significantly. So what I'm going to do is go over the need, the basic design, and the management of these types of outlets and so that you understand what they're like and what they're used for. In the Red River Valley, as in a lot of areas, we have flat ground and shallow ditches. We generally have a high water table at certain times of the year. Uh, as you can see in this picture, I'm looking out over a, of a, a section field. You can see how flat it is. This particular lift station has two outlets, two pumps in it. The ditch is full because this is taken right after a relatively large rainfall event, and that is surface runoff in the ditch. The need for lift pumps, as I mentioned, we typically our tile main line is six to seven feet below the surface, but our ditches are typically less than three uh, three feet or less in depth uh, because the water table is high. So we have no gravity outlet. It wouldn't pay to dig the ditch deeper. Uh, we don't have the outlet for it, so you can't make it deeper, so we have to lift it. Another reason for lifting, as you can see in this one, you can just make uh, out in the la back part of the picture, there's a road across there, and there's a culvert under the road. And the elevation invert of the culvert sets the water elevation in this ditch, as you can see on the outlet of this pump. So therefore, this cannot gravity drain, so a lift station was needed to lift the water up to that so it can flow out the culvert. Roads and culverts quite often act as barriers to water movement uh, within the countryside. Some other need uh, reasons for lift station. The outlet ditch uh, may fill up after a large rain and take several days to subside or from snow melt. Uh, this is really to determine this is based a lot on local drainage knowledge, how long that uh, the drainage ditch would take to fill, and how long it would take to drain down after a large rainfall event. Farmers also, uh, there are a number of farmers that want to be able to control the water leaving the field. Uh, they like the idea of being able to turn the pump on and off, especially in flooding conditions early in the spring. Uh, we have had some situations where you had to put in lift stations, although we could have gravity drained uh, when, they calcul when they determined the grade of the laterals in the field, uh, it was very shallow and would not drain properly, so they put in a lift station in order to get the grain on the laterals. More and more we're hearing about people that uh, the only outlet for the water is on the other side of a low hill where it might be a 10, 15, 20 foot rise. And so uh, they are using lift stations to uh, lift the water up over the top of the hill to the outlet. In this picture, you can see uh, the tile outlet where the yellow flag is. And then of course, that's a surface drainage uh, uh, culvert with a, a backwater gate on top of it. This was taken in a uh, uh, dry period uh, in August and September. This picture was taken in the following year in early June. You can see that same yellow flag, but if you look on the side, you'll see that the water level was much higher. In fact, we couldn't see the flag at all. This picture was taken a week after the precipitation event. And so this system drains uh, the field, uh, it's a gravity outflow, it drains properly, except the lower part of the field stays wet much longer. Uh, farmer not necessarily satisfied with this uh, arrangement. So the basic construction of a pumped outlet is you have some type of a sump buried in the ground. You can see on the left here the tile main comes in. Typically these, uh, the sump is from 12 to 15 foot deep, although some have been put in deeper, some less shallow. There's some kind of a support on the bottom. This can be the bare earth uh, when it was excavated, if it's hard enough. Otherwise, a lot of farmers will put uh, crushed rock in the bottom, and some even, uh, if they can, they'll put uh, a concrete base. The water will fill up inside this. The pump will be installed. Uh, in this case, it's a submersible pump uh, on the bottom. It sits on top of uh, supports to keep it off the bottom so it's not pumping 
any uh, sediment. And you have a riser pipe and to an outlet into the ditch. This is a very typical type of outlet that we see. However, you have to sense the water level in order to control the pump and motor so that it's the pump is only pumping when water is inflowing. A water level sensor of some sort, which I'll cover later, is inserted into the sump. Here's a typical sump. Uh, in this case, they're using the concrete casing. Uh, the pump is, the motor is located up uh, under that yellow cowling on the top. This one has an alarm system. It's got a float down there that if the, water, if the pump is supposed to be on and the water level gets so high, it'll turn it on. And when the farmer drives by, you can see the red flashing light. This is another pump. It's a direct, uh, by another manufacturer, it's a direct coupled uh, motor directly to the shaft. Uh, the impeller is at the base of the sump. And this is a new construction is not yet fully connected to its uh, outlet pipe. Sump materials and insulation. Uh, it's important that the casing materials uh, have to be solid and have to be fairly thick. Uh, we've tried corrugated metal. We found out that uh, they can corrode in a relatively short period of time and so they need to be coated with some type of a mastic or some other uh, material. Uh, more and more we see in the last five years just about all sumps going in are plastic. Uh, commercial uh, makers of uh, drain tile actually provide custom made plastic sumps for people in this area. Uh, we have some people that can get a hold of concrete sections. They are using concrete, but more and more we see plastic. The mainline entrance into the sump must be sealed very well on the outside to prevent washouts. Uh, when the mainline is put in, these uh, the reason that we have uh, custom made plastic ones is that they have the connections built right into them so that the drain tile can enclose right in it with a rubber boot. In using concrete, sometimes you have to knock a hole in the side. Uh, if you don't seal it tight enough, uh, water, uh, you get a large rainfall event, water will wash down. If there's any entry into it, it'll wash soil in. And from people that have to dig these things out, they, uh, that is a, nothing they want to do again. So they want to make sure that the mainline entrance of the sump is sealed very well. The bottom material, as I mentioned, could be concrete. But generally, it's just uh, six inches of uh, crushed rock in the bottom uh, to provide a, a solid base on which to set if it is a pump. And quite often, to put the sump in, like I mentioned, it has, goes down 12 to 15 feet. Quite often they have to do in some places, especially in sandy areas, they have to dewater. And so dewatering would be uh, an additional expense to put these in, but typically the most dewatering usually involves installing a series of small diameter wells that are connected to a pump to remove all the water in the area so they can get in with a backhoe, dig this in and set this. This is not a frequent occurrence, but I have seen uh, several lift stations put in uh, in areas where they did have to dewater. Here's a typical uh, plastic uh, custom made sump casing. It's got a metal cover. You can see it's locked uh, discharge. This particular casing uh, made by one manufacturer. Uh, here is another one. This is a dual wall plastic. Uh, and uh, what we have found that if you have the type of pump where the weight rests on the top of the sump, that dual wall will start to accordion or to crush and slip down. In that situation, the uh, pump installer knew this and so he built a frame to support the weight of the pump so it's not resting on top of the casing. So drainage pump stations. What I want to talk about is the pump power sources, uh, electricity, internal combustion engines, solar, wind. Where do you locate them? Um, pump selection, power requirements, and then the pump controls. And I'm going to go over the float type and, and the new, relatively new variable frequency drives. So to start off with, the pump uh, station location Ideally, you would like to water 
outlet the pump station right next to the electric service. This limits the pumping distance and the pump size. It also limits uh, the um, expense of connecting into electric service. However, there are many cases in the countryside uh, where the electric service is located in an area of the field that is, uh, and it's more desirable to put the lift station there and that affects the design because you might have to change the main design and other parameters in order to get the water to the outlet place. There's always a trade-off, the cost of extend extending electric lines versus cost of piping. And of course some of the other consider considerations you would take into account is the potential for vandalism. Can you get to the site after a large rainfall event? Uh, this is very important. Uh, I've seen lift stations where they're surrounded by 100 feet of water that are not working and they got their electric. Well, do you walk out through the water to work on this? Or do you make sure you build it up so that you can get to it uh, in a dry fashion to work on it uh, so that the pump is pumping and removing the water from your tile system when it's needed? Soil stability is a big factor. Uh, you don't want to lift put the lift station right next to uh, a major drainage way uh, they can the soil can wash away and expose the sump and probably even fill it in and the other uh, uh, impact on neighbors lift stations uh, when they do run they run for a long period of time in this picture you can see a lift station don't worry about that wooden box that was one of our monitoring stations but if you see the trees in the upper left hand corner that is the edge of a farmstead the water in this location flows from left to right and it flows right by that farmstead but this that farmstead is occupied by people that don't farm they just live out in the country the field that is uh, tiled that feeds this lift station is actually located on the other side of the to the left of of that farmstead and so uh, if you had the normal place to put this lift station would have been on the upstream side of the farmstead but what it would do is it would pump water and it would drain through this through the ditch and and uh, it would become a source of, of water for mosquitoes and cattails and this and a nuisance to this neighbor so to save these future problems the installer put the lift station downstream from it so that the water is flowing uh, away from the farmstead and not towards it in this case this is kind of an ideal location you can see the pump is located right next to electric service the connection charges are are minimal in this situation and uh, and as you can see by looking at the field this field is level enough that the the installer and farmer that put this in had the option of uh, moving the lift station to where the electricity was uh, accessible uh, for his uh, pump station up till now you've heard me talking about electric service uh, but frequently I get questions about can you use uh, solar can you use wind to power these pumps can you use internal combustion engines and you have to realize that when these pumps turn on they can run from anywhere from four to ten days straight now the float operated ones are going to turn on and off but they have to operate uh, on a continuous basis because the flow out of the tile is quite slow and if I assume anybody that's been around drain tile know that if it starts off with a high flow and then flows for a long period of time well we've in that case then uh, the motors on these uh, pumps are typically can be anywhere from 3 to 10 horsepower uh, that requires quite a bit of uh, power uh, to move um, uh, the water and so therefore solar and wind you would need some type of a large battery bank to provide that water uh, that power for that amount of time in order to effectively operate the lift pump uh, there might be wind while you're operating but it's it's not an on again off again operation when when it's time to uh, for water that flows in you have to pump it at that time internal combustion engines I know there are some people working on in uh, developing pumps that operate uh, with internal combustion engines. The uh, 
problem here is again the long period of time that they run it has to be a good effective stationary engine uh, it has to have a gasoline source so you're gonna have to have some kind of a uh, or some type of a fuel tank located nearby right near your sump in your field and it would have to uh, again run for a long period of time stationary engines can do this uh, one one drawback is that uh, after about 100 to 150 hours of operation, most stationary engines have to have the oil changed and, and the filter. So it's an additional amount of labor. I, have, I know uh, there may be some out there, but I have not seen them at this time. So right now I want to talk about pump requirements. And that uh, sizing the pump uh, determining what flow rate you need for a particular project or lift station and what's the total head you're going to pump against. These are two parameters you need to select a pump. Let's start with the pump capacity of flow rate. As you can see up at the top there is a formula there. Uh, the, the gallons per minute is equal to 18.9 times the selected drainage coefficient that you want to use for uh, pumping and uh, the area that is being that has been tiled or will be tiled or future areas so in this case I am using uh, 3 eighths of an inch drainage coefficient and if you can see if you do that for one acre I substitute that into the equation up above you'll see that the gallons per minute per acre needed is 7.1 gallons per minute per acre so if you're draining a hundred acres to make this easy you'd need a pump at maximum flow uh, maximum design capacity the drainage coefficient uh, which sets that upper limit to move about 710 gallons a minute uh, at that peak if you were designing at a half an inch drainage coefficient you would need a pump that would be able to move about 950 gallons a minute for 100 acres so that moves a lot of water uh, in a in these uh, pump stations about what would come out of a uh, drain tile. Typical lift station uh, is shown here. I already show, talked about the sump and the inflow. In this case, uh, this is a submersible pump, and uh, the manufacturers have uh, published minimum submergence depth for these pumps uh, for cooling and anti-vortex in this case uh, this particular pipe pump needs about 30 inches of submergence uh, the impeller is located near the bottom of the pump but you'd need 30 inches they don't sit right on the bottom they sit up above uh, usually about six inches above the bottom so that they don't pump sediment so you can easily have about three feet there well if your inflow uh, the invert of your tile is uh, six or seven feet below the surface you can see you got to add on another three feet to that in order to uh, uh, provide the the submergence depth uh, on the on a submersible pump the other and then that minimum submergence depth then determines the lowest point of which you would be pumping from and in that case that would be that would determine your maximum lift most of the lift stations uh, that we have the average maximum lift is around 9 to 10 feet uh, some are less than that but around 9 to 10 feet when you lift to the surface and discharge uh, as shown in this picture if you have a drive shaft pump station that's where the motors up at top if you remember earlier the earlier pictures that showed the yellow pumps there's a drive shaft that goes down the impeller is located in the screen again it's above the bottom and this manufacturer requires a minimum submergence depth of about three feet uh, for anti-vortexing so again that determines your maximum lift and very consistent with the submersible pump around nine to ten feet uh, is your maximum lift pump stations the capital investment can be quite high. The pump and motor uh, come as a unit brand new depending on the horsepower. Uh, those costs can range from three thousand to seven thousand dollars for just the pump and motor. The sump installation uh, can run from two to five thousand 
for the materials and digging out the hole and lowering it in and, and all the other uh, associated expenses. And then the pump control system. Uh, what's going to turn that pump on and off uh, to uh, when it's needed? Uh, and that can run anywhere from 1000 to $4,000. So if you add those all up, uh, the total to put in a lift station on a tile project may be fifteen dollars to $20,000 with uh, electric connection charges and if need, dewatering is needed. A sizable investment, uh, but sometimes very necessary. I'll give you some example of what's the pumping cost on a per acre basis. Uh, there is a farmer up in Grigola, Minnesota, which is about 45 miles south of the Canadian border in northern Minnesota. In 2010, this farmer received just about 35 inches of rain uh, measured in his rain gauge at his uh, farm. He has 25 pump station electric meters. Some of these electric uh, the electric meters uh, supply power to more than one pump station. And so these meters monitor the pumping on about 5,000 acres of drainage, tile drainage that this farmer has installed uh, over the years. In 2010, which is uh, 35 inches of rain is more than, is about 12 inches over average for this particular area. His total electric pumping uh, bill for all of those lift stations was $30,000, right around $30,000. So if you average this out, you'll see that his cost per acre is about six bucks an acre with a range uh, that went from $3 uh, for some of the larger fields up to ten fifty. Now he had two smaller fields in there. One was 55 acres and one was 70 acres. And because they're very small, and uh, the, especially the 55 acre one produces a lot of water, his pumping cost that year was 12.50 and 15 per acre, uh, respectively. So the cost per acre to operate and to drain these uh, is really quite low. In fact, the meter charge is a significant portion of the cost of operating. The actual pumping electricity use in this year was uh, was not that not that great. Um, but he has to pay the meter charge uh, 12 months out of the year, and that contributes significantly to that $30,000. So the actual energy charge for pumping is fairly low. To give you some idea of the pump horsepower, uh, we've done a lot of checking on pump efficiency, low head pumps used for uh, pumping. Uh, we find that they are about 30% efficient, which means about 30% of the power you put into them is actually moved into the water to move water. So on the left, you see the total head goes from 6 to 16 feet in this chart. And then the flow rate is 500 up to 2,000 gallons a minute. The shaded portion uh, is limited to up to 10 horsepower. It's been our experience that a lot of the local electric suppliers do not like to provide single phase power to pump motors greater than 10 horsepower. The inrush current and the effect on other uh, farmsteads in the area can be very uh, huge. So they, they really don't want to supply power of more than 10 horsepower. So if you look, like I said, our total head on most of our lift stations is eight to 10 feet. So you can see at about 700 gallons a minute, you can see a five horsepower motor uh, pump uh, supplied by five horsepower would more than be sufficient to supply that. And that is a, a very common size. Um, if you had to uh, move 1,500 gallons a minute, what a lot of uh, installers uh, do is they put in two seven and a half horse so that they are not um, um, providing all the power to one 15 horse. And so they are staggered, so the one seven and a half would be come on, and when the flow rate got high enough, it would trigger the second one, and then that one turn on. So they're not turning on at the same time. As you can see, most of these uh, these are single phase motors, and um, uh, the general average size uh, ranges from three to ten horsepower. When I talk about fixed speed pumps, I'm talking about a pump you know, when you turn it on. It's at 60 cycle, it goes up to full speed, and it stays there. Uh, when it goes to full speed, it's going to move uh, the maximum amount of flow that it's capable of. 
So in order to match the flow coming into the sump to the flow rate of the pump, you need floats. Just like uh, if any, if you have a uh, sump pump in your basement, it's float operated. Uh, same same principle. So this, you have to have a certain amount of storage volume then, uh, in so that these pumps don't turn on and off too often. And again, the storage volume is calculated based on the maximum inflow rate, which is your drainage coefficient. Uh, and we talk about pump cycle times. How many times an hour will this pump turn on and off and then back on again? And most manufacturers will tell you that their pumps, the motors that drive their pumps, can handle about 10 cycles per hour. That means one complete cycle is every six minutes. So sometime in a six minute period, the pump would be on and pumping and then it would be off. Uh, that's most electric motors do not like to be turned on too often. So what we've found is if you work it out, the maximum number of pump cycles actually occur when a tile inflow rate equals half the pump flow rate or in effect equals half the drainage coefficient, the design drainage coefficient. So to see what that means is then you have to, in your sump, you have to design in a certain amount of storage depth. Now again, that has to be the area located between the inflow or uh, the uh, invert of your tile uh, line and the minimum submergence depth of the pump. So in this case, uh, shown on this slide, I showed a storage, storage depth that then would be in between uh, those two. And so you'd have a pump on and pump off. Quite frequently, those in, in a lot of sumps, that distance between the pump on and pump off is about three feet. Here's a picture of a sump. Uh, the float controls, you can see the pump is that green uh, submersible pump down below. You can see the tile, drain tile inlet, water coming in. The water rises up so high, and when it gets so high, that pump turns on. And when the water drops so low, it shuts off. So it's on again, off again operation and uh, it, again the, the, more, uh, the pump comes to full speed and then shuts off. So how much storage would be needed? Again it's a very simple formula shown across the top. The storage volume per acre in cubic feet per acre is equal to two times the flow rate and n is the number of cycles per hour. Like I said, most manufacturers say that their pumps can handle up to 10 cycles per hour. So again, if I were designing for a 3 8 inch drainage coefficient uh, and designing for the maximum cycles per hour, I'd need 1.4 cubic feet of storage for each acre. So again, using our previous example, if you had 100 acres, you'd need 140 cubic feet of storage so that you, at maximum inflow rate of 3 8 inch, with the 3 8 inch drainage coefficient, you would have, uh, that pump would be cycling 10 times an hour. Uh, if you um, had a half an inch drainage coefficient, you can see that you would need 1.9 cubic feet or 190 cubic feet. But let's stick with that 3 8 inch drainage coefficient uh, to determine what size, uh, to give you some example of what size storage you would need. So you got some options. Uh, one of the innovations that uh, that the farmers in this area have come up with is they use horizontal storage. Uh, the old style pump stations that uh, used vertical storage. So let's look at that. An example of vertical storage might be uh, a vertical sump. Uh, and if we use 3 8 inch drainage coefficient with uh, n equal to 10 or 10 cycles per hour with three foot on and off on 120 acres you can see you'd need a nine foot diameter sump. That's a very large sump. It's very difficult for people to install that size of sump uh, casing uh, in order to get that amount of storage so that that pump is operating properly. You'd have to dig a very big hole down 15 feet You'd need a very large uh, device uh, machine to it, set it in place. Uh, our farmers quickly found out that this size of uh, 
or an installers found out that this size of storage is very difficult to work with. So the innovation they came up with is to use horizontal storage. In this case, they have a four foot diameter sump, a vertical sump, but then connected to it, they use a two foot di diameter dual wall pipe. And they set the on off so that the dual wall is uh, part of the storage. Now this can be dug in uh, with a backhoe much easier and you can design around this. So in this case, if we use that same example, drainage coefficient of 3 eighths of an inch, a cycle time of 10 uh, times per hour that the pump turns on and off, a four foot diameter sump, again, three foot on off uh, float controls with the two foot diameter horizontal storage, you can do that same 120 acres with 44 feet of dual wall or you could go to 50 feet if you wanted to. So this innovation uh, was adopted very early on when lift stations came into um, this part of the country. Here's some pictures uh, that one uh, manufacturer, pump manufacturer gave me. Uh, you can see the vertical sump there and then the horizontal storage uh, that they are putting in and uh, 10 foot sticks of two foot dual wall pipe and here they've got uh, approximately 100 feet of dual wall storage for this particular installation. This innovation has uh, most of our installers use this now they do not use uh, large uh, vertical st storage sumps uh, it's just uh, too difficult for installation. Here's uh, again I think you saw this pump uh, earlier concrete casing going down but this farmer put in 70 feet a two foot diameter dual wall pipe to service about 160 acres of drainage that goes through this pump. You've already heard me talk about uh, float operated fixed speed pumps and the impact they have uh, even even with provided the adequate storage depth we have found that a lot of motors tend to burn out early uh, reduces their useful life. So about four years ago a new innovation in lift stations came about and that is the, uh, the adaption of variable frequency motor controllers or sometimes called VFDs uh, on the to operate the pumps. The, the basic de the design of the pumps hasn't changed anything at all but the uh, the controllers are instead of the floats we now have VFDs. Uh, we, they've been in operation for about four years. The, the nice thing about a variable frequency drive is you can power them with either single or three phase power if it's available and what they do is they take the input power whether it's single or three phase and they will convert that to DC and then reconstitute that and the output power will be three phase use of three phase motors on pumps is highly desirable over a single phase. For one thing they're a lot smaller, uh, there's less wear on them, uh, they tolerate uh, uh, starts, uh, they, they can handle these uh, different speeds and they have the VFD has soft start options so that they start up very slowly so there's not a lot of inrush current they start up and come up to uh, full speed. However, in order to make these work, you've got to sense the water level in the, to control the speed of the pump. And typically, you, the speed of the pump is determined by the cycles coming out of VFD, and they can vary from a high of, from a, a high of 60 cycles per second down to about 30 cycles. And that gives you a wide range of flow rates that you will control the speed of the pump and therefore control the flow rate coming out. So in, a, in essence, uh, the pump output matches the input into the sump. Therefore much less storage is needed than a fixed speed pump. And here you can see it, uh, I've taken my standard design, but now uh, typically uh, you don't need that storage, uh, so much of that storage depth. You still need some, uh, but you still have to have the pump cooling and anti-vortex depth around the pump. But now you can have a little bit shorter sump, doesn't have to be as deep. Uh, and, but you still need some kind of a water level sensor to tell you to hold what water level to hold that uh, pump at. 
and the lift station stays pretty constant once this pump is uh, set in place because the water level sensor will hold it there so you have a constant head you can you can better match the pump to the flow rate you need uh, Here's an example of one type of water level sensor that one manufacturer makes. This is uh, inside that gray box is a pressure sensor. Uh, this is uh, a sealed airtight unit connected to a plain piece of two inch PVC pipe that's inserted through the top of the uh, cover of the lift station goes down to just above the bottom of the sump. As the water level rises in the in the two inch PVC pipe it changes the pressure inside the pipe and this sensor senses it so you program the controller for a certain water level and then the pump will automatically adjust to hold that water level in that range in this picture um, it shows uh, you've seen this before but I wanted to point out that black box just to the right of the discharge pipe is a, a common VFD controller used in the Red River Valley it's been my observation that over the last three years, just about all lift stations going in now use VFD uh, technology. Pump stations can be used as water control structures. Uh, in this picture, uh, which you have seen before, the lift station, the sump uh, casing sticks above the ground. So it's high enough so that uh, water can rise in it and so you can control the water leaving the field. So the general recommendation if you're going to use it as uh, if you're going to turn this system off and allow the water to rise and fall the casing should extend at least two feet above the ground surface to allow it, this to happen. And if you in the future you wanted to use this system for sub irrigation it would be high enough then provide enough head that you could actually pump water into it for sub irrigation. Here's a, a, one of our uh, farmers has put this system in several years ago. This is a 100 acre field. You can see your standard lift station, but it's uh, the top of it is right near ground surface. Uh, this field is really quite level. It, the, uh, this system was put in in 2002 uh, before we learned a lot about uh, sump and sump design. Uh, this is used for sub irrigation. Uh, in uh, early spring and fall, of course, the sump is used to dewater the field, but in July and August, the PVC pipe on the right-hand side that goes into the sump, uh, water is pumped into the sump and raised up. There's a separate set of floats in the sump that uh, allows the water to come up to about two feet below the cover of the sump. And that backs water up through the main into tile and it backs the water up into this field approximately 11 to 1200 feet and that allows them to sub irrigate the uh, lower half of this 100 acre field. However, here is a photo uh, taken in uh, the spring of 2011 and you can see the pumps are not on but uh, when the water wants to flow it flows out. It just goes into the barrel of the sump and then flows out from underneath the cover this particular uh, system has uh, about um, across this field the main has about a seven foot drop over over 3,000 feet so there's a bit of a head and uh, water will always find a way to get out so some management recommendations for control structures and pumped outlets and I'm going to limit this to our area of the country uh, because here uh, our max front uh, max uh, bare earth frost penetration is greater than three feet and we and the Canadians to the north of us have found out that uh, if you try to hold water back in a tile system over winter it'll freeze up in you and sometimes it can take well into June to thaw out uh, it's it can be uh, and that's about all you can do so our general recommendation here is after harvest we shut off pumps uh, we don't want them pumping when it's too cold outside because uh, sometimes enough water hangs around that it can actually freeze up inside the pipes. We do have frost that forms within the sumps uh, and ice can build up on some 
wires and we have had uh, situations where the water levels dropped and the ice hanging on the wires have pulled them out and uh, ripped them out of their connections. So we shut off the pumps. We raised the baffles in the control structures to allow free drainage. After the frost is out in the spring, we turn on the pumps. Uh, we do not, uh, we leave the control structures open for free drainage. We have found that after the crop has emerged, uh, usually this is in early June in the northern areas, we set the baffles and the control structures to the elevation that we want and then we and we turn off the pumps uh, to capture as much water as we want. If we happen to have a large rainfall event, we then uh, can always uh, pull out baffles or we can turn on the pumps. Uh, this is a judgment case. It all depends on where that uh, rainfall events occurs in the development of the crop. Well, that concludes my presentation on water control structures and pumped outlets. I hope that's, uh, that I've enlightened you a little bit about these structures. If you have any questions, uh, please contact me. My email address is right here.